Welcome to the Green Table Talk. I am your host, Janine Johnson. Today, we are meeting with my friend, Terrence. Terrence, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey. So, I brought you on the show today because you have a very interesting story. Uh, you, in my opinion, by hearing your story, is like the epitome of strength. Like, you've been, you've been through so much, and, well, I'm not gonna jump into it just yet. Tell a lot, it's about Terrence. Let me know about you, any hobbies, what do you enjoy doing? Tell us a bit more about Terrence. All right. Well, being on this whole journey, it's different because you can't really do anything. So from when I started out since I was really young till now, it was we're revolving around the hospital, either mm -hmm. work, school, hospital. And then you were tired and stuff. So I didn't really do anything. I hung out with some friends from time to time, but I really didn't do anything because of being tied to, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, you uh, needed a kidney transplant, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, you mentioned that you were preemie. So what happened mm -hmm. when you were a baby? Did they notice something was a little bit off? Or tell me more about that, or as much as you can remember, because, you know, obviously, you're oh. a preemie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically what happened is at birth, they noticed that some stuff were off. So they kept me in the hospital and they transported me over to sick kids. They ran for the test and they found out that's the situ situation I'd be dealing with is that one kidney does not work and I only have one mm -hmm. functioning kidney, but it's not even 100% okay. itself. So I was followed by, the, yeah. I was followed by them at, at the kids for like 18 years and they transferred me to TGH and then they transferred me from TGH to St. Mike's. So it was, um, it was like, it's weird because you're running back and forth all the time you're in school, you're going here, you have to be off, you're, you're wondering, okay, everybody else gets to go out, you have to stay in and mm. then there, yeah. So it's just like a lot of stuff, like my parents are very protective. No, you're not going, no, you're staying in here because they know already, I already have that issue. So anything mm -hmm. then I could be in a problem. So I stayed in a lot and did my own thing. Mm -hmm. Now, did your parents explain to you like why you're staying in and what's going on? Or did you, you know what I mean? Like, did you ask a lot of questions? Obviously you're asking why, but you know, how did that play out? Yeah, they, told, they, they I always noticed when at the beginning of the school year, then they send that whole thing home that first day. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel any different as a child, but um, when you got older, like you're in high school, going to college you now, and you'd be running over with the, the collection, you're, you're running to school with the collection in like three or four plastic bags and mm -hmm. put it up between your legs and then wait for class to and drop it over the lab. And then, <laughs> that's when it gets kind of, wow. yeah. So how do you explain that to your friends? Like you're in high school and like you said, this is what your, your life is like, mm -hmm. and this is normal for you. But what about friends? Like, how do you explain why you're always continuously going to the hospital or going to the lab? Or like, how do you explain that? You know what? When I wasn't there, I wasn't there. They didn't really, I didn't really speak like to my high school friends, et cetera. They didn't know about um, my situation because it never impacted okay. me there. Like at high school, I'd mm -hmm. leave early to go and and stuff like that. Take mm -hmm. home, pick up the, the stuff and then go downtown. So it was yep. easier in high school. During school, like mm. when I was in elementary school now, my friends there, they knew. They were a lot younger. Yes. So they used to come over to my house and stuff. So my parents would tell them. So mm -hmm. that's how I dealt with it then. So if your friends in high school didn't really know, mm -hmm. where did you get your support from? Like, did you have a good support system at home? Or what did you, where did you turn to for support? Uh, Home, yes. Um, like my relatives, close family friends, um, mm -hmm. were my support. It's mostly and close family okay. friends. And then I was I still talk to some of my friends from elementary school to this day. And oh, they good. always yeah. So some of them I've known like 40, 40 some odd years. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So tell me about, you know, you're going through life now, you're you know, you're doctor tells you, you know what, things are changing and you're, it's time that like, you're going to have to start seriously looking into 
getting a transplant? Like, walk me through that process. Well, first thing they tell you that the kidneys are actually failing, they had to go on to dialysis. And mm-hmm. once I go on dialysis, now they're going to start doing my workup to get me on the list. And you had to okay. go to a battery of tests. So I had to do all these CT scans, ultrasound, this Doppler, that Doppler, ECGs. Like I did a lot. Now I know what the tests them all mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can I can kind of read them just okay. by me. But um not trained in it, but you kind of know like your peers say, oh, they're like this, that, whatever. Mm-hmm. You kind of understand them a little bit better now. But I went through all of those tests. I remember them really well. And so you also had an upper hand, I guess we can say, in terms Mm -hmm. of your knowledge, because, you know, you work in the field, let's just say you work in a hospital. So you had extra knowledge that some other people won't know in terms of dialysis and knowing different types of dialysis and all that stuff. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Um, That's the beauty of me being a patient and a staff member. So you were on dialysis for how long? 23 and some odd months, close to 24 years. So I got my yeah, I got my transplant in January and I started dialysis, um, I think April. So I was a couple months shy of 24 years. Wow. And which yeah. dialysis um, process did you decide to, to go with? Well, you know what? I am, when it comes to needles, I hate them. I'm mm-hmm. not going to lie. My mm-hmm. veins are so small. So with that being said, I didn't want any needles being poked into me. And then all the horror stories that I hear, they have to, they have to, they have to poke you twice Mm. and all that. And I said, "Uh -uh." that was me. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So I said, you know what? I'll go on PD. So I went on PD for five years Mm -hmm. and um, I had a peritonite. Yeah. So I, I did that. And it was fine for the first couple of months, but the, the first delivery, I can tell you, I was living at home at the time. First delivery came in. There was about a hundred boxes there dropping off at the front of my house. <laughs> and the same time they put, they dropped the delivery off. We were having a for sale sign put on the front on the house as well. So can wow. you imagine my mom the house to be sold and the Dallas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we have somebody coming to look at house and show in. So we had to put them into the, the garage as quick as possible that nobody would see. Them. Mm-hmm. So that was that was it. And then I did that. Um, went to a couple parts of um, peritonitis, and mm-hmm. I said the last bout. I said I didn't know about this, mm-hmm. but I remember when I was first the hospital St. Max was one of the first to have um, nocturnal dialysis. Okay. So I was part of the pilot. So I was one of the first four patients wow. in all of them to start nocturnal dialysis program. Now, actually, before so, we continue, explain to our audience what peritonitis is. Peritonitis is an infection of the peritoneum cavity. The, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a membrane that goes around your whole stomach. So it basically it's, it assists with, peri- with um, the word. It filters. It's, okay. what, it's part of the lymphatic yes. system. What filters, and that's what they used to pull the the sugars, the dextrose. What they used to use in the bags, mm-hmm. they, they on the outside, and it would pull everything from there into it, and then come out through the um, catheter. Okay. And is yeah. it painful, or is it just an uncomfortable feeling, peritonitis? It, it is very uncomfortable. You can't you can't sit, you can't stand. When you get really bad, any pressure you feel it, um, you you just feel awful. Mm-hmm. The only time you feel better is when they give you the antibiotics at the hospital through okay. the ID. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So because of this, you decided to do nocturnal dialysis. Yes, I I, I said I I can't do I can't do this anymore. So mm-hmm. I did nocturnal, but within hemodialysis, what I learned about because they always talk about the two needles. No one ever told you about the line. Yes. The IJ line. Mm-hmm. And I found out about the IJ line. I said, okay, this I can do. Because you just do a little surgery, you put the mm-hmm. IJ line in, and you're good to go. Mm-hmm. I, ne- I 
during the year, because um, I did it for a long time, I only had my line changed twice. Wow. Never That's had very any line, Yeah, never had no line infections, nothing. Wow. So I was, I was good that way, yeah. Yeah. I remember I had my line put in and maybe about, I want to say about a month, maybe six weeks, my line just fell out. And okay. I was just cleaning up around the house and I just bent over to pick up one of my daughter's toys and it just fell out and I mm. freaked out because I thought, you know what, if I move my hand, it's just me spewing blood or something. You know what I mean? And I was just mm -hmm. so nervous. And that day I actually mm -hmm. had dialysis. I was supposed to go in for dialysis as well. And I was okay. just I was so nervous. But yeah, mm -hmm. so it's good that you've only changed it twice. That's mm -hmm. very, wow. Yeah. So talk to me more about nocturnal dialysis now. So you've decided this is the path you're going to go, uh, you're going to take. So is there like a, a, a curfew? Do you have to be at the hospital by a certain time? Lights yeah, out at well, a certain time? How does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, we used to, when they first started, there was only four of us with two nurses mm -hmm. um, because, so that they can cover and whatever. So it was like you'd get in there about 9, 9.30, but you weren't, because you were in a room with four patients, they weren't actually using the actual clinic. So okay. they, they used, you were not right across from the clinic in one of the patient rooms, they converted over to a center for, for the, um, where they had beds because you sleep in there. So yes. they had the bed there. And um, you basically stayed at 9, 9.30 and you'd come off at about seven in the morning. So you okay. were there all night, you slept mm -hmm. and they did you well. You, you got all your good meds. I got to sleep really well. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was good. And then as the program grew, then they moved the nocturnal program into the regular dialysis main unit, the main center. So now, okay. because they're there, you have to be in earlier. So I would get because I was working, so I would come right after my shift, and they okay. put me on as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, so at least, because they knew I had to work in the morning too. So I would finish doing dialysis. Like they put me on, say, about 8, 8.30. And okay. then I would finish, because they usually try to aim for seven to eight hours mm -hmm. because the pump is a lot slower. They don't oh. use, when you go in for a four hour session, you're getting pump speeds of five, 400, 500. Mm -hmm. When you do night, you're getting 270 to 320. So take it's like time. you take your time, you sleep, you sleep through all the cold blues that you hear. I, I slept through everything. <laughs> so and it was yeah. really good, yeah. I remember when I started uh, dialysis as well in the hospital, Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, the speed is faster, right? So mm -hmm. they're, you know, the blood out faster and they're, you know, cleaning in it. And I used to get so lightheaded, nauseous. Mm -hmm. I, like, mm -hmm. sometimes I'd, I'd throw up. It was just mm -hmm. so much. And mm -hmm. that's when they said, okay, no. So they slowed it down and it mm -hmm. was a bit easier. I mean, I still got nauseous, but nowhere near the, what, the way it was before. So mm -hmm. doing this your way, that sounds mm -hmm. like a dream. Like you just sleep through it all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most of the people are on the nocturnal dialysis program they are their full-time students or they work full-time. So okay. you want to keep some some semblance to your life, mm -hmm. at least you're, you can do your full-time job and then you come in at night. And then if you have your shift core like done proper, you can actually go home, which yes. it worked yes. out for me with my first <laughs> couple of years. For yeah. about 15, 14 years, it worked out great with me then. Mm -hmm. because I was not working where I was working. So I got to go home and sleep and then come in or flip whatever to make it easier. Yes. But, um, wow. and then when I started working there, now everything worked like I just left. I ran from upstairs to downstairs, upstairs to downstairs. <laughs> you had a down pack like clockwork. Oh, my schedule was well known. I'd be sitting there and going, yeah, I'm going home. I said, soon. They don't realize the home is upstairs. Yep. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the clock. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about when you received the call, letting you know that, you know what, we have a kidney for you. Let's mm -hmm. walk through that process. Well, they had me on hold for a long time because I had some hookups along the way. One being I had cancer in my thyroid and mm -hmm. then lymph nodes and then parathyroids and took that out so they had me on hold to make sure that was in remission mm -hmm. and then 
I got, I had to basically work up again because all my stuff was so old. So they okay. woke me up later last year. So it was about November, December. My stuff mm -hmm. was being done like that. And then they said, um, they said to me that um, they're going to reactivate me on the list on the 4th. Now, I had already known, but I knew it was because one of the nurses called me, but they also send you a letter in the mail. Mm. So, I, I, um, so I said, okay. And she said to me, um, you'll probably get your kidney sooner than later, maybe about three months or so. Even the doctor was done about three months and you'll have your transplant. I said, okay, good. Whole winter, we're all right. Mm -hmm. Got the call the Friday. Now I just got put reactivated the wow. day after New Year's. So yes. Like the second or third, something like that. So it was earlier in the week, I was reactivated. And then I get a call. And um, a lot sooner than three from months. Michael Tosky, yeah, like five or six days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was in Dufferin Mall. It was a Friday evening. I was in Nofros picking up groceries. And I That's got a call. That's in your brain, St. Mike. right? Yeah. Got a call. It says St. Mike's on my phone. I said, I'm thinking, okay, they have called me for a shift or somebody's called me from there. Something is going on. So yes. I pick up the phone. And so just like I thought it was somebody else calling. But I said, uh-huh. Goes, I'm calling, I'm so, uh, doctor said, I'm calling to let you know that you're here. I'm calling that you got a transplant. I said, huh? <laughs> I said, you know, I'm in the grocery store right now. <laughs> uh, I had to drop my groceries. I had my best friend and his daughter with me. I had to drop them back home and then get, try to put myself together because I'm coming to the hospital now. I have to look appropriate when I come in there because I don't know what knows me. So, <laughs> I came home, packed up stuff because I was not wearing that, that gown, but I got stuck in the gown for a couple of weeks, a couple of days. So I packed up everything here, mm -hmm. all my stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then they had me, the, the, the thing what she said to me, she asked me a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. You have all this, that, have you been around um, COVID? Uh, and we, and the two of us started to laugh at one another because we know the situation. Mm -hmm. So... And she says, okay, I need you to come and do, come to St. Mike's tonight. I said, okay. And she says, um, do dialysis and then stay over. Don't leave. Come and see me over in the transplant office, which is mm -hmm. right, behind, right behind the dialysis unit. So I went over there. I'm sitting there. Ate the night before. Didn't eat nothing all day. Saturday morning, I'm there. Didn't eat anything. Wow. And then because they didn't know what time the transplant was coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm sitting there. I got admitted about two, three o'clock. And they said, now it's a waiting game. I said, I'm used to that. I've been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. And then we still can't eat because the kidney comes in. We have to do surgery right away. And then they told me at about six, uh, it's not coming today. Uh, might be coming tomorrow, tomorrow morning early. Mm -hmm. And then, I said, okay, that's fine. You can eat. I go, okay, what am I going to eat now? And I saw, I said, I'll just take the hot water for the tea. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. all I wanted is the hot water for the tea. And so then, all this time you haven't eaten anything and all you want is no, tea? I, all I want is tea because I know how the food can be sometimes. So oh, okay. <laughs> not, 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 not the not, best. And then it's Saturday and most of my friends that are working are full-timers. So they're not there on Saturday. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering nothing proper. So I said, yes. okay, you know what? Let me just um, drink this tea and bust the gas and mm -hmm. hope that mm -hmm. everything works out. In the morning, they told me, don't eat anything. Don't drink anything. Kidney's on its way. I said, good. So they had me wait till about 2.45. And then they rolled me down, brought me down to the um, the OR room. Mm -hmm. And I was there just talking to everybody in the OR room, even the yeah, um, everybody in there say, I know you, I know you. But we know you. I said, yeah, we know. <laughs> everybody knows me. Yes. Goes, yeah, yeah. And then we're talking. I said, I said take, take good care of me. You know, I got to come back and work. And you're going to need me to do some tests, book some stuff. <laughs> they said, yeah, of course, of course. And then I woke up because they had, during, during the transplant, that, there was complications, so they had to take mm -hmm. out lymph nodes. 
and mm -hmm. when they took out the lip note that they sent the pathology to get tested. Mm -hmm. So there I'm sitting, I'm hearing about this afterwards. I was on the table for X amount of hours because I don't mm -hmm. remember waking up until I went into um, the PACU or post-operative okay. care. So when I, when I woke, it was like about quarter to 12 before wow. I woke up. And then in about a half an hour, I was going upstairs, but I, it was, but I'd gone down from 245. So that's a long mm -hmm. time to be gone. Mm -hmm. And I woke up with the Foley catheter, not my friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I woke up with the Foley catheter. It was not a nice experience. I, I, I thought some night, like when I, I got up one night, I walked, I pulled. I said, oh gosh, they're going to have to take this out and put it again again. I said, I don't want to go through that again. Yeah. So, um. Everything worked out. They didn't have to do that. But so far, the experience has been really good in good. regards to the whole, the whole thing. All mm -hmm. the um, accommodations I get for my blood mm -hmm. work going to the lab. Twice a week, clinic appointments once a week. And mm -hmm. um, then it went to twice, twice a month. And then good. now on monthly. I believe, yeah, okay. on monthly. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going, it is hiccup along the way. You still have to go in yes. and do things. So you had to get the stuff removed. Mm -hmm. Not pleasant, but it has to be done. Next, if I ever have to have that done, knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would tell them to knock me out. You know, it's a two minute or not even, I think it was like a 90 second in and out thing, but mm -hmm. not, not pleasant. <laughs> um, and then I've had to do some tests in regards to infection because mm -hmm. I, last week was my first week back into work. Yes. And it's still going. No, no, back. I'm assuming you're doing modified um, yeah. work, et cetera. Okay, which is good. Yeah. And then I end up with an infection. Well, you got an infection? Yeah, I got an infection. Um, last week I started to feel kind of off. Mm -hmm. I, worked for, I worked Thursday. Then Friday was okay, but not kind of sluggish. Saturday, I couldn't move. Mm, wow. So I said, my back hurts, my legs felt weak, everything. I said, you know what? I'm getting some cold draft in mm. here somewhere. I'm saying, because there's always, the change of weather, there's always a draft coming through this window or this door because mm -hmm. my building is new and they're still doing a lot of construction on it. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay. So I went and I slept. I kind of slept and I got up. No fever, no this. Okay, I said, I'm good. Whatever it was, I slept it off. Mm -hmm. Monday, I still didn't feel as good. Sunday and Monday, but I said, you know what? It'll be okay. Monday, I mean, Tuesday, mm -hmm. I went to do my blood work. And I said, they did everything and blah, blah, blah. And then I looked at the rest on the my chart app. And I said, everything is elevated. So I called, I called my doctor directly. And I call, and then I call them, they go, this is what's going on. And they go, okay, come back. We're going to, and they ask me, are you here today? Yes, I am. Okay, we'll just fax you the requisition. I want mm -hmm. you to do your analysis. I said, that's fine. Fax it to me. I'll run, run and get it done because there's a couple floors below me. Mm -hmm. So um, I went and did that. And then I said, and then they called me back, like in about an hour, two hours later, and said, yeah, um, it's not COVID because they had me do a COVID swab. It's not yes. COVID, but um, we think and with the pain that you're feeling in your back and all that stuff, yeah, you have an infection. I'm going to send a, a script down to the pharmacy to start you on the, start you on the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So I picked it up yesterday, and so I've done a full day of it today. Still feel kind of off. Yes, but it's a lot better now. That's good. Back, yeah. Wow. One thing I've learned, yeah. One thing I've learned, you have to you have to know your body. If you're not feeling good, haul yourself to the hospital. That's the best way I can put it. Don't mm -hmm. sit down and say, Oh, it's just a, because for us a little cold or a little this can mean the big thing. Yeah, it's true. So, Very true. Not only now, fresh after surgery, because you just had it in January, but mm -hmm. years later, you still have to take those extra steps, extra precautions. Right, because mm -hmm. our immune system's weak. It's weaker than yes. the average person. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just something that we have to continuously do for the rest of our lives, literally. Yeah. 
That is so true. it's good that you picked up on your on the signs and you realized something, you know, something was off as opposed yeah. to, you know, in the Caribbean, you know, how our family is. It's like, oh, it's just gas. It's just gas. Right. Just drink some tea. <laughs> just drink some tea. It'll go away. Yeah, drink some tea. Yeah, it all ease up. A gas man. Gas go anywhere. Hey. <laughs> Take drink some tea and go lie down. You'll be okay. Right. I'm <laughs> check two kind of now. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. So you're on the mend. You're starting to feel better. You're mm -hmm. you're taking your time. You're you're just getting back to you mm -hmm. again. Last mm -hmm. time we spoke, you you told me, um, which stuck in my brain, that it took a little while for you to get used to sleeping in your own bed. Yes. Right. Yes. Reason for that, doing the nocturnal, you're at the hospital three nights a week. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other three nights you're here, but you're here only at home for a couple of hours and you're going right back to work. So I didn't yes. get to enjoy my house. Mm -hmm. So now the first couple of nights when I got home after being discharged, I am seeing myself getting up, packing things. Oh, got to go to St. Mike's have dialysis tonight. And I look, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I just took off my stuff and went right back into my bed. And then That's a forced habit. Yeah, it's a forced habit. Force of a 23, almost 24 year habit, right? Yeah, more. I, I spent more of my life being on dialysis than not being on dialysis. So mm -hmm. it became a part of my life. Yes. So, yeah. Um. So now you're feeling better. The transplant, mm -hmm. other than the infection, transplant went great. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Just to just to touch upon this, um, while you were going through dialysis and you were going through your own health issues, you took it upon yourself because of your job. You took it upon yourself to help others that were sick as well, and yes. you you did this willingly. Like you you there was no fear. You weren't mm -hmm. concerned. You, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, a very close friend of my, my best friend's stepmom um, um, had diabetes and then it didn't, they told her she had to go on dialysis and stuff. So she ended up getting a transplant. But when she first started, she used to call me for everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, so any test that she goes in, I'm um, having this symptom. Either her husband would call me and ask me, um, she feeling this. I said, oh, that's not good, you know. I think you need to take her down to the hospital. Let them sort her out. And, and that happened for years. I forget how long she was on dialysis for. <laughs> but I remember they called her and she did her transplant on my birthday. About wow. five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago, and I was even the one who took them to the hospital. The, the, mm -hmm. I remember her going in. So, yeah, I did that. No problem. Mm -hmm. Plus, it was COVID as well, so you weren't worried about okay. getting COVID or anything, you know. You were in a hospital. Right? No, about that either. Just fearless. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then three yeah. years on dialysis. Mm -hmm. You're working in. The, you're in a position mm -hmm. where you know you're mm -hmm. you're around a great team of people who embraces you, who knows you. You know, you got a, mm -hmm. a great you know staff that was there. You went in and out of the surgery. Everything was good. Everything mm -hmm. was good. Do you mm -hmm. feel that this was fate? Do you feel this was? you know, a divine intervention? Do you feel this is just, a, a, you know, it was God or, you know, Buddha or whomever you might believe in, or just think, you know what? It was just coincidental. There was nothing, you know, it was bound to happen, you know? So <laughs> how do you think? What do you think about that? When I look at everything I've gone to, I said, everything is lined up the way it's supposed to be. So if it's not, I always believe, if it's not for you, if it's for you, it's going to be for you. But I look at it, it is divine intervention. I was lined up with a whole bunch of, group of people mm -hmm. um, and they're basically put in my life for that reason. So yeah, God had, uh, uh, God had his hand in the mix and that's what happened. That's how everything lined up the way it's supposed to line up. Beautiful. That's why I firmly, yeah. Wow. 
That's amazing. And I'm glad you feel that way because yes, I think that everything does happen for a reason. I've always said that everything happens for a reason. Um, this journey is not an easy one. So you have to have great support system and a, a strength, like a belief system as well. You know what I mean? So I'm happy to realize, I have, I'm happy to know that you realize that everything lined up the way it was supposed to. Cause some people don't, some people mm -hmm. feel that, you know what? That's the way it was supposed to happen. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's how everything happened. And it, it wasn't faith or anything of the story. They just, you know, some people feel that, you know, it's, eh, that's mm -hmm. it, you know, but yeah. I'm glad you acknowledge. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is the time that I will normally share with our audience and with you uh, something called, I call a nugget of knowledge, a little nugget of knowledge. And okay. for you, the nugget of knowledge that I feel that reflects you is this phrase that I got from Veronica Roth. And she said, life is not about being fearless. It's about acting in spite of fear. Mm -hmm. And I think that represents you perfectly because, you know, you were going through, like I said, you were going through your own health issues mm -hmm. and you help others in need and you mm -hmm. weren't fearful. You, you weren't, mm -hmm. you were just, you know, you, you did it head on and there was no hesitancy. There was no, you know, reluctancy. You just did it. And mm -hmm. I, I commend you for that. And I also commend you for coming through your journey you know, looking great, you seem healthy, strong, mm -hmm. everything's great on your end. And mm -hmm. I just, you know, wish you all the best because, uh -huh. you know, you de definitely deserve it. You've been through it. And now here mm -hmm. you are sharing your testimony, sharing your story with our audience. And I really mm -hmm. appreciate you joining us right here on the Green Table Talk today. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for this platform to say my, to tell my story. So usually I kept it to myself and stuff. So I'm glad that I could share it because a lot of people don't know what yes. goes on the, be, the, the before the, the lot of after they don't know like you get very basic information mm -hmm. and as i've said uh, a couple times in this um co our conversation that knowing you have to be an advocate for your own health if you don't advocate for yourself no one will but yes. as well if you're in the industry and you know a lot of the in the, the, the players in the game Mm -hmm. You feel like you're working with family. You're, yes. you're, you're, you're dealing with family. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful to all the nurses that took care of me and stuff, the doctors, the, the clerical, like all of those guys. Mm -hmm. And um, one nurse in particular, my friend Dahlia, she was like the first dialysis nurse that I had. And she um, started with me on the nocturnal program when I was the first of mm -hmm. four patients starting the nocturnal program up until the end when, even the day when they called me, I called her and mm -hmm. so they called me and she was in shock. And um, when I told her, they told me to come in, she goes, good, I'm working tonight. I'll set you up and do everything. <laughs> so you're ready to go in the morning. <laughs> so I'm very grateful to her. And she calls and checks in with me all the time to do so. Yeah. Thank you, Delia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, Terrence, once again, thank you for joining us here on the Green Table Talk. I'm happy you joined us and shared your story and your journey. And of mm -hmm. course, feel free to come back anytime. All right. Thank you. All right. Take, take care. care. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. Bye -bye.